subject, Behold the Sun. Message number 25. How do you behold the Sun in this, behold Him in His life, behold Him dying for us, behold Him going into hell and conquering Satan for us, behold Him risen from the dead for us, behold Him then coming back, reigning in us. How do we behold Jesus alive and reigning in us individually. How? Number one, we perceive the plan. Number two, we receive the lamb. Number three, we believe the man. We believe the man, the Christ, unchangeable. We believe him with faith unshakable. Seven reasons to trust in or to believe in the Christ unchangeable. Based on 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 11 to 17, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust, I thank Christ Jesus my Lord who has enabled me for that he's counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. I was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. I was a rascal, but because of his, but of, of his grace, his mercy, his faith, and his love in Christ, I have been made a teacher, a preacher, an apostle, a soul winner, Paul said. I repeat, because of his mercy, his grace, his faith, and his love toward me, I am no longer a persecutor injuring people, hurting people, but I got my eyes open and I've caught on to the wonder of this Jesus. And when I saw him, when I was first converted, I can't quit seeing him. Always looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God and then also is now returned back through the power of the Holy Ghost living in me, reigning through me. Glory to God. Paul says, I was a nothing. I was a nobody. I was a no good. But because of the mercy and the grace and the faith and the love of Jesus Christ exceedingly abundant toward me, I am now. Somebody come to town. Hallelujah. He said, follows that statement by saying, this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation. He was thinking about his own meanness and evil life and how Christ came to save him. He said, this is a faithful saying that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. I was the worst one that he ever met. He saved me. He can do it for anybody. That's his point. How be it? For this cause, I obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul said he converted me. He changed me. His love was big enough to work on me. I keep looking at him and I have caught on to the idea. He did it for me so that I can be an example that the worst sinner in town can be made a tender, wonderful, Jesus-loving follower. Hallelujah. I think that's terrific. I've got some more to talk to you along these lines. But for today, we're stopping on that verse 14 on the word love. Four things were exceeding and abundant toward Paul. Mercy, I've preached on that. 
Grace, I've preached on that. Faith, his faith in us. He's committed the gospel to us. I preached on that the last time I preached to you. Today, his love, which all of it's all exceeding abundant. Aren't those terrific words to hook together? Either one of them would be enough, exceeding toward me, or abundant toward me. But no, he says it's better than that. It's exceeding abundant toward me. Is that the way you feel about the love of God? Do you think about it? Do you behold him and ponder him? And meditate on him and visualize him? We've just served the communion, the Holy Communion today, in a beautiful service here at International Gospel Center. Hundreds of people have partaken of the wine representing his blood and of the bread representing his body. What were we doing beholding the Son in our communion service? God left with us through Christ this symbolism to help us behold. God wants us to behold. God wants us to look. God wants us to think. God wants us to remember what he did for us. If we remember what he did for us, we have no problem with faith. If we look at him steady enough. Stephen looked up when they were stoned him steadfastly into heaven and saw Jesus. Look steadfastly in your faith and behold the Son. Never let anything divert your eyesight, your vision, your spirit from remembering the Son. How wonderful to think that our Master, who is so rich, it seems to me like he don't need me. It seems like he could get along well without me. Why would he think so much about, wonder about me? But this song, remember me. It's a scriptural song. Jesus said, as oft as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Why should he care if we remember him? It's not to his advantage, is it? It's to our advantage that we remember him, don't it? Isn't it? He's a world man. He's a world savior. Hallelujah. One God, one mediator between people and God. Jesus Christ. What does he want to mediate for? What does he want us to remember him for? Remember me, remember me. The songwriter caught the vision. What for? He's doing pretty good without us. I think he must be happy. I don't know what he wants. I don't know why he's sitting up there in all that light, why he's not contented. Don't you see the importance of you? You are part of his plan. Perceive the plan. Receive the lamb. Believe the man. The plan. God has associates. Special associates who are paid for twice. He made us who are made twice, paid for twice, deemed twice, stored twice, deemed wonderful from the beginning, made us in his image. He deemed us. I deem things, don't you? I deem them wonderful or pretty or beautiful. He deemed us, then he redeemed us. He stored us. He stocked us. Then he restocked us. We blew it and wasted it and, and squandered it, but he restored us. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. He established.
established us. Then he re... And we blew it. And took everything that he gave in our establishing. And blew it and gave it to the devil. But he never quit on us because he needs us, I guess. And he re-established us. Hallelujah. He claimed us from the beginning. But we blew it and sold ourselves in high treason out to Satan. But then he come back. He said, but I'm not through with you. You're so beautiful. You look like me. I created you. You're for my purpose. I need you. My world depends on you. I got good ideas, but I can't do anything without you. Huh? Yeah. You IG people, IGC people are smart. I say that in a lot of churches and stop and they're quiet. They don't know what I said. He's got good ideas, but he can't do anything without you. And they think, hmm. They close up. But when you get light, when you perceive the plan, you see the idea. God is spirit. We are his flesh. Down here, he's got to have flesh. That's why I'm not interested in helping people be holy. God's got enough of that. Be spiritual. He's got enough of that. You can't beat him at that. Even if you try. A lot of folks trying to play God all the time. Trying to be as spiritual as God is. God's got lots of that. You can't improve on that. But God don't have any flesh. Down here on this earth, he wants contactability, tangibility, touchability. God, touchable. That's what we are. That's the plan. Perceive the plan. Receive the Lamb. He's the Lamb of God, slain the foundation of the world for your sin. And then you can believe the man and go anywhere. But it all goes with beholding the Son. Are you with me? Exceeding abundant. His mercy is exceeding abundant toward us. His grace is exceeding abundant toward us. Last week I preached his faith in us is exceeding abundant. He believes we can do anything. We are the only ones who limit what we can do with God. But when we perceive the plan and understand that God believes we are terrific and that God's beautiful ideas are stalemated unless he can find human vessels to work them through. How many times have we preached so rigorously and so rhetorically? God would send angels, but he can't. He leaves it to people. And we all clap. Oh, first time I said that, everybody got happy. Yeah. That's pretty good. We need to get that down in us. God, with beautiful ideas, is waiting to show his mercy, his grace, his faith, and his love to people. Because he needs people. And when he gets in people... Then look out, devil. Poor devil. <laughs> Amen. Then God can go places. Verse 14, that's what I told you. The grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Plenty of it. He hasn't run out. He has a stock of it. You believe he's got plenty of faith and love? Faith in Christ Jesus? His faith? Can that become your faith? Sure. Love in Christ and it becomes in you in a good supply. We say he has come that we might have life, that we might have it more abundantly. Paul writing about it, he said it's exceedingly abundant toward you. Don't ever tell me you can't love people. Don't ever tell me you can't believe. There's an exceeding abundance of it in Christ all offered to you. Hallelujah. Plenty for you, baby. 
Say plenty for me. Plenty for me. I, have I have it. I have everything I when I have Christ. Because all of God is in Christ. And Christ is in me. Plenty of faith. Plenty of love. Plenty of mercy. Hallelujah. I remember when we were pastoring a church before we went to, uh, just after we came back from India. It was a church where we had the vision where Jesus came in our room. I remember one, a dear uh, woman in the church, a family, the Clark family, and uh, dear Sister Clark, we called her. What a precious woman. And she would lead the song, the singing in the church, the, this kind, you know. And we all held the hymns and stood on the third verse and, or the fourth verse and had her uprisings and down settings and all that. <clears throat> I bet it was nice. It's nice. Don't you like it the way it is now? Isn't it nice and creative? Wasn't that beautiful today? We learned some new songs. Isn't that beautiful? <clears throat> One day, I, I'll never forget it. It made a great impression on me. She was leading. She found that old hymn, he think, Thou thinkest, Lord, of me. And she got singing that and commenting between each verse. I'll tell you, she just got to preaching a little bit on each one of those verses. She was a wonderful woman. Everybody loved her. But it, it, we got to crying because God, we got to thinking about this. God is thinking about us. Now, we were still the weak worms of the dust down here slithering around on this earth in trouble and the devil about to get us, but we had somebody on our good side. We couldn't find him or touch him, but he thought about us. We were gaining. Oh. God. It's wonderful to think of God remembering us. Isn't it wonderful to think that God wants us to remember Him? I wonder, I'd like to preach sometime on what God wants us to remember Him about. Wouldn't that make a great sermon? You preachers, go ahead and preach that. That's a good idea. What does God want us to think about Him? I'm sure he wants us to think about his faithfulness. I'm sure he wants to, us to think about his ideas in his covenant. I'm sure he wants us to think about that he's going to come and get us. A lot of folks just living for that, not worth 10 cents a car load, just waiting to get out of this mess, you know. <laughs> and boring, and half of them backsliding in the meantime because it got so boring. I'd backslide too if that's all I was waiting on. Takes too long. I'm going to zip now. I get a zing when I lift somebody. Amen. I get a blessing when I get somebody healed and saved. Oh, hallelujah. I'm not going to sit in the corner and suck my thumb and wail holy wails. <laughs> waiting, waiting to escape this mess. No, I love this mess. <laughs> hallelujah. 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 I almost spoiled that. That was such a good line. And I almost spoiled it because another thought was flickering into my mind real quick. And I wanted to tell you about it. That's, that puts a new light on God. Love, so love the world that he gave his only begotten son. What good are we if we don't? Love what God loves and do what God does and give this message to our world. Oh, hallelujah. And we get our minds off of how wicked and cruel and sleazy it is. Why, there's folks so holy, they don't hardly unlock their car between the holy sanctuary and their holy living quarters. For fear some of this awful world will get in on them. Get in on us. Some folks are scared of the world and so scared of devils. They're just in torment all the time. There's somebody the other day, quite a group I heard, was praying to keep the devils off this platform. Hey, you don't need to pray for that. I'm up here. 
<laughs> I'm up. I can tell you. I mean that. And that's not bragging. But if I didn't, couldn't say that, I would disgrace what my Lord did for me in his death and in him conquering Satan, rising the dead, coming back, living in me, poor devil. Bless God, no, you don't have to pray to keep the devils off of here. That's taken care of. And I don't mean we don't recognize the devil. I know devils. I can smell them probably farther than you can. We've been where the real ones are. Over here, a lot of them are make-believe. But anyway, anyway, I'm not here to preach about the devil. I, I'm disgusted with him, and I don't want to ever tell anything publicly or in writing about him except that him and all of his demons are a bluff. And they're not for real. And they can do nothing. The conqueror is him. Behold the conqueror. Get your eyes off of the conquered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the place. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Shout a little bit. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Lord. You're the victor. You're the victor. Hallelujah. You're the victor, Lord. Oh, glory to God. Oh, glory to God. Stay on your feet a little bit. Sing a little bit. All hail the power of Jesus. Name. Let angels cry. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Hallelujah to the King, to the King, to the King, to the King. Hallelujah. 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 You may be seated just a jiffy. I just want to tell you one little story here, uh, and then we're going to go. Uh, a dear prostituted woman was carried to our meeting, one of our meetings in a wheelbarrow by three other women. She had been prostituted by men for years. Body was eaten up with cancer. Her belly got big. Her legs got skinny. When that happened, the prostitutors didn't want her anymore. They always turn away after they use them up and abuse them and infect them and ruin them. Then they're through with them. They drop them. But there's somebody that you can behold that never drops anybody. Hallelujah. Jesus never quits on anybody, prostituted or not. Hallelujah. She was so overwhelmed that night as she heard the loudspeakers and heard the nice words coming out, words of love. We got to the end and we had told the people how we were going to help them to receive this Jesus and embrace him in their lives. And then we would pray for the people. The women that came with her helped her. They had put some old pillows and old blankets in that old wheelbarrow so they could carry her as careful. Can you imagine? It's one wonder she didn't hemorrhage and die. The poor thing jiggling along on that, but they had a few pillows to absorb a little of the jiggle, not even a rubber tired one, an old iron wheeled wheelbarrow. And she, uh, she told them when we was getting ready to pray that they were going to help her, but she didn't want to pray for healing. She just wanted to pray for salvation. She just wanted to receive Jesus. She said, oh, the life I've lived, I could never ask him to, to heal me too. I've done such awful things, but if he'll save me, I know he'll save me, but I've heard. And so, just to be kind to her, they, they helped her. They prayed during the prayers. We prayed for that multitude of people, that precious woman. It was so precious. Jesus came into her life and changed her. When she came to, she found herself standing up out of the wheelbarrow, up on those bony legs. And her big old dress that had hung over this big growth 
was hanging loose. There was no tumor, no cancer, no nothing. She was well. Hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about. His love is exceedingly abundant toward anybody, everybody. He created everybody. And he don't want the devil to have anybody. And whatever your life, he loves you. Kim, young man here from Korea, from Norway and then Korea. I mean from Korea, born there and then he was in Norway and then he came over here. Just wanted to be part of this. He came just the other day. Most of you know him. And uh, he's very, you know, he's very, uh, sometimes in a way reserved in, in his talking expressions about God, partly because his English is real limited. But he's gaining on that. But, uh, but he told Daisy and me, and as he went to tell us, he couldn't keep the tears from coming in his eyes. And it was embarrassing him as an Oriental. He didn't, he didn't like to show that kind of emotion. And he'd wipe them and with his limited English, but he finally got us to understand. He, his mother and father had written him. His mother had written him. And it was the most precious thing that he'd ever received. He said, the first time in my life, she said, Kim, I love you. And then he cried. He'd never heard that from his mother. Has a good home, has a good mother, has a good family. But it's just not their custom to do that. I love you. And he cried. Less than a week later, he come to us and he wanted to tell us something else. And he's so happy. And he cried again. He couldn't keep from crying about this. He says, I wrote my mother. And he said, for the first time in my life, I told him, I love you. And he's so thrilled. Let's never take it for granted. It's for real. And when we behold the sun, and we look away to that old cross, and we see who was hanged there in our name, in our name, in my name, that he did it in my name. He did it for me, and I'm saved, and I feel like Paul. You know, he said before, I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, I was a no good. But oh, his mercy, his grace, his faith, and his love that's in Christ was extended exceeding abundant, plenty of it for even me so that anybody can look at me and understand, oh, that's what God can do. I can be an example so that the worst of sinners can say, I see he loves everybody. His love has no limits. I receive it. Hallelujah. I want to pray a quick prayer before we leave here today for everyone that came that's not right with God. There's nothing like the joy of knowing you're right with God. There's nothing like the peace of being able, being able to go to bed at night, turn off the lights, go to sleep peaceful and tranquil. I wouldn't know what it is not to be that way. But I read books. Daisy and I read. We try to find out how people are that aren't like that. And we find out they suffer. Al, the motorcycle man from Wisconsin, he's still working on the deal. Him and his wife, they got back together. They came down here and he's in a, he was in a hotel room. And, and someone hit his motorcycle, and his motorcycle was his love, and it made him mad. And he came to the door with his pistol, angry. He was going to shoot him. And one of our, somebody from, from IGC was there. I may have had that story tangled up. Isn't that the way it was? Yeah, someone from IGC, huh? Yeah, yeah. The Lord stopped him, and he didn't shoot. And then he made contact with someone at IGC, came here, and gave his life to Christ, got saved, and is so happy. And now he's on his way back down here. I mean, here this guy, God loved him. You believe that? And he didn't realize how much God loved him. And he told us, he said, 
That night, when he went in his hotel room to go to sleep, for the first time since he came from the Korean, from the Vietnam War, he turned the light off to sleep. First time. Big, tough man with a beard, boy. So insecure that he couldn't sleep without a light on. You see, sometimes people look so tough, so rugged. We all put up our front, you know. But what I'm talking about is the discovery of love that's non-judgmental, non-condemning, all-embracing, never accusing, that says to you, I love you, I reach out to you, I need you, I want you to think about me, God says. I had this communion service, he said, so you'd think about me. I don't want to be forgotten when you come to church, think about me, think about what I did. Never forget my love for you. Have you remembered him with your life or have you forgotten about him? Have you disappointed him? Is he lonely for your companionship? You say, oh, I'm lonely for his. I need him. He needs you. Can you say, come home, Lord? Oh, you said he's already home. His mansion's heaven. No. His home, his rightful dwelling place is in you. That's what he created you for. First person breathed into them. And in the original Hebrew, there's no way to explain it, but he imparted himself into that and it became living like him in his image, in his likeness. That's what you are. I want to pray a quick prayer for you before we leave. Everyone that's not right with God, whatever your condition, some of you, and, and if you let me pray that prayer, Jesus will come to you and make himself real to you in a moment. He can come right where you're at and help you, and you can be made whole, you can be blessed, you can have a change in your life. I want you to listen closely. Young and old, don't move for just a moment. Here's what I want you to do. I want to ask you to take one step that'll show me that you're interested in your own soul. If you're not interested, it don't do me any good to be interested. But I believe you are because you're in the house of God on this beautiful Sunday. You came, you heard his call, or you wouldn't have come this far. Here you are, so now I'm asking you, work with me and let's settle it with God in just a moment or two. God's anointing is on me to preach, it's on me to pray. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. We pray, God will answer prayer for you. And what you need, you're going to get today. Get ready? To take this step. If you'll take this step, I can help you. If you don't, you tie God's hands, see? He has to wait for you to say, I want you, Lord. When you do that much, God will do the rest. Here's what I want you to do. So I want this to include everybody in here who's not right with God. Some of you have gone to church, but you've never been saved. You've never had this born again experience. This is your day. I want you to do what I ask you to do, and this is your day to receive that wonderful, fresh, new birth with God. And you'll know you'll be God's friend and partner, and you can turn the light off when you sleep. Hallelujah. And have peace with God. No more guilt, no more condemnation, no more being down on yourself. Others of you will say, Brother Osborne, I once knew God, but I turned away from him. I backslid, or I fell out of fellowship with him, and I'm ashamed today. I'm sorry. I wish I could retrace it. But, but uh, what's done's done. But I have good news. Today, you can begin anew. And Christ never follows you and says, I'm mad at you and I hold it against you. Even when you did it, he didn't get mad at you. He was wounded, but he bore that wound in your place. And he says to you today, I love you. Let's get back together. You'll make it this time. You believe that? Take this step. If you're like that. Others of you will say, Brother Osborne, I'm one of those that call myself a Christian, but I'm not right with God. If Jesus came today, I wouldn't be ready. If I died today, I wouldn't be ready to face eternity. I'm not right with God. There's sins, there's habits, there's practices in my life that stand between me and God. Only God knows about them. They stand between me and God. I want to get rid of them. Today's the day. Take this step. Are you ready?